Thank you, Elfa. What a powerful message. If you've ever felt overwhelmed by life, maybe it was a predicament you got yourself into, like Peter walking out on the water and took his eyes off of Jesus and found himself sinking in the waves of the storm, or maybe it was something that for whatever reason, the devil had brought upon you in your life and you just felt overwhelmed and you realized your powerlessness, it's then when you realize how amazingly powerful and strong God really is. He can reach one hand down and his arm is not too short to save you no matter how far you've sunk beneath the billows. Would you bow your heads with me as we pray, opening today's message. Our Father in heaven, thank you that you have watched over us from before we were even born into this world. You knew every hair on our head and you know every number of them and you knew every DNA strand inside of our bodies and you knit us together in our mother's womb. You thought more about us that we can't even count all of the thoughts that you've had toward us. And yet here we are, Father, in this world sometimes we get so busy with life that we forget about you. We forget to think about you. We forget to pray to you. We forget to call upon you. We forget to read what your word tells us you want us to know in our lives and know for the world and the battle that we're living in. I pray today that you would renew us, Lord, within, that you would be here and fall afresh upon us with your Holy Spirit and bring your peace, your love, your joy into our lives and Open our eyes, Father, to help us to realize that you are greater than anything we can face in this world. And also, Father, to see the work that you're wanting us to do in our life and in our community. Please speak today through your word, through this message, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a famous quote that says, All warfare based on deception. When able to attack, we must make them think that we are unable. When using our forces, we must seem to be inactive. When we are near, we must make the enemy believe that we are far away. When we are far away, we must make them think that we are near. This is one of the quotations taken out of a book well-known book titled The Art of War that was written by a general and philosopher named Sun Tzu. He was a Chinese general and he was a military strategist and philosopher who lived between 545 and 470 BC. He's recognized for authoring the well-known, well-written, well-read book, The Art of War, which focuses on military strategy and it's influenced some of the greatest battles and some of the greatest wars that our world has seen. It's shaped military thinking throughout the centuries. The Art of War has also been read as a philosophical work by academics and by the general public, and it's often quoted today in newspaper articles and magazines, and you might have even heard someone, or you might have even used a quote from it yourself without knowing where it came from. You ever heard the quote, keep your friends close, but your enemies closer, a well-known quotation taken from this book. You see, war is something that our world is familiar with. Some of you in this room have been involved in wars that our country has been connected with. Every day, our wars are taking place in various locations around the world, and and young men from different countries and young women are giving their lives for causes. Some of them don't even really know what's at stake in the causes that they're fighting for. We're, we're familiar with it. We've seen the devastation on, the, on the, um, the television screens or firsthand or the pictures in the magazines. We've read and seen on the History Channel and in the history books how the wars have come and gone throughout our world's history. It's something we're all too familiar with. And war is something that is one of the greatest tragedies that we've experienced in our world. The Bible records conflict from its first stages in this world, in Genesis, when Cain took up some sort of implement and struck his brother Abel, and the first death occurred in our world, and soon, not long later, you find another man who murders another man, and and then bloodshed begins to run rampant through the earth. It becomes so wicked that God destroys the world with a flood, and then you find that after the flood, people, people picked up where the previous wars had left off, and 
empires rise and they march and bloodshed flows through cities and war is something that is horrible, horrifying. People who have been in it and come home are never the same. And friends of mine and friends of yours, family members of yours, you in this room have seen things that God never intended for us to see because of wars that have been waged in our world. And yet, as familiar as war is here in this world, the Bible points out that this is not the place where war first originated. These wars and these great generals and these great armies that have marched and, and driven in tanks and, and gone on conquests, these are merely footnotes in the grand scheme of the war that, that uh, spans beyond our world's history before it and all the way to the end of it. And these great men and these great strategists who first mastered the art of deception and, and as Sun Tzu wrote, the art of strategy and the art of war, these were nothing compared to the true general, the true master strategist who was the father and the true leader in the art of war. Open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 12. As you're turning there to Revelation tw chapter 12, the last book in your Bibles, the, the, uh, the apocalypse, Revelation is an epistle which is a letter that was written by the apostle John and it, was a, it is a series of visions that John received while he was exiled on the island of Patmos. And he tells you in chapter 1 that God sent these visions to him through Jesus and through an angel. And he saw these visions which were telling him the great things that would take place from his day all the way to the close of time in this world's history when God's kingdom was fully set up and everything was made new again and, and there's a final end to this art of war that our history is so familiar with. And then John was told to record these visions that he saw and to send them out to God's churches so that his people would know what would take place in their day all the way to the close of time. Revelation is written in the form of a chiasm. A what? A chiasm. A what? A chiasm. You may or you may not have heard this word before, but this is something that it's a literary style that the Hebrew writers used oftentimes in many of the books of the Bible. And it's one that is used repeatedly throughout the book of Revelation. And it's important because a chiastic structure tells you what's the most important theme that the author is trying to focus on. So a simplified understanding of a chiasm is that the, the flow of the entire letter or the flow of the entire uh, written work mirrors itself. The beginning, the, the beginning is going to mirror the end. The second point is going to mirror the second to the last point. And when you come to whatever the central point is, right in the center of this whole chiastic structure, this is what is the great climax of what the author is wanting you to see and wanting you to understand. And you can go back in your Bibles after church and you can look and see that each of the series of sevens that are given in Revelation form smaller chiastic structures throughout the book, the seven churches. You compare the first and the last and you'll see similarities, and the second and the sixth and you'll see similarities, and you'll go right to the center and you'll see what's the grand climax of this series of seven churches, of seven seals, of seven trumpets, of seven plagues. He uses this theme repeatedly throughout the, the, the flow of Revelation, but the entire book is also written in a form of a chiastic structure. And right at the center of it all is Revelation 12, 13, and 14. In other words, what John wants you to see is the grand crux of the entire message of Revelation. What's the core, the climax of this great series of events that would happen from his day to the end of time? It's right in the center. It's Revelation 12, 13, and 14. And we're going to be going through those over the next few weeks. And Revelation chapter 12 is what we're focusing in on today. And this is the beginning, and it introduces you to the characters and the backdrop of what you're going to see is going to play the central role in the great scenes that have been taking place and that will take place and come to a culmination before Christ comes. Revelation chapter 12. In this, you find that there are three, uh, three headings, three scenes, if you will. The first one is verses 1 to 6, and you read about the characters of this great drama of the ages. You read about a woman, a child, and a dragon. 
The second scene is verses 7 to 12, and this tells you the backstory. This tells you the origin of the dragon, of his war, and how he's cast down to this earth. And then the third scene is Revelation 12, 13 to 17, and this tells you about his persecution towards the woman and how this would play a role all the way to the end as well. So let's focus in a little bit more closely now that we have an overview of it. Revelation chapter 12, let's read the first scene, verses 1 to 6. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. This crown, it's important, I'll point out now, is, is not a royal crown. It's what's called a Stephanos crown, which is the crown that's promised to the seven churches who overcome. They'll be given a crown, and this is a crown that's given to victors. Those who would win in the Greek games of the Olympics would be given this wreath crown showing that they were a victor. And so he sees the, the moon under her feet shining with the sun on her head, a crown, a Stephanos crown with 12 stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. And his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God, to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God that they should feed her for a thousand two hundred and three score days, which is three and a half years. Here you find at the beginning, you see these three different characters that are presented. The first focus is John's there. He's on the island of Patmos, desolate, isolated, a prisoner of Rome. And as he's seeing this series of visions unfold, all of a sudden, there's, he looks up and he sees in the heavens that are above the earth this huge, enormous drama being played out in the heavens. And he sees a woman and she's there and she's in a vulnerable state, pregnant with child, but yet glorious and exalted. The, the moon is under her feet. The, the light of the sun is shining out, her garments are radiant, and this beautiful Stephanos crown upon her head that has 12 star, stars upon it. And this is a, a vivid illustration that John immediately recognizes as God's people. Throughout the Old Testament, you read in many places, and I'll give you a few references throughout the sermon that you might want to jot down in your note section, because we won't have time to go through and read everything. But let me just insert this here footnote, at least two-thirds, some people say three-fourths of the book of Revelation is imagery that's borrowed from the Old Testament. And so as you're going through and you're reading things, a lot of times in order to understand what's going on, he wants you to think back to passages and stories and, and prophets' writings in the Old Testament, and this is no doubt one of them. You remember the story of Joseph in Genesis um, in Joseph's dream in Genesis 37, where he sees this picture of the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars that are there. And, and of course, he's one of those stars, but all the rest of the stars and the sun and the moon are bowing down and paying homage to him. And right away, his father recognizes that this is a symbol of their family. This is a symbol of his 11 brothers who are paying homage to Joseph and the father and the mother. And you see this imagery used throughout the Old Testament, the number 12 associated with God's people in the Old and the New Testaments. Twelve tribes of Israel, the twelve sons of Jacob, the twelve disciples of Christ. This number is oftentimes throughout the Bible associated with God's people. And a woman is also, throughout Scripture, you know, I'm not telling you anything new at this point. This is a woman that's referring to God's people. But it spans beyond just the Old Testament time. It's not just one time period. Some people have said, well, this woman is Eve. Well, that can't be true because of the exalted position and all the way up to the time of Christ. Although to Eve, the prophecy was given that a seed coming from her, a child born from her, would one day crush the head of the serpent. Some people said, well, no, 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 this is Mary. She was the one who gave birth to Christ. Well, again, this doesn't fit because it doesn't span the time and Mary isn't 
depicted in this exalted position that, that John sees Mary depicted at this time, and it doesn't fit with the 1,260 days. But what does fit this story and what scholars and Bible students have seen is that this woman represents God's people in the Old Testament times, but spanning on through the New Testament times of God's people throughout time. As Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11, 2, and Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, 25 to 32, that the woman, the church, he was going to present to God as his bride a chaste virgin, pure and spotless, clothed in white garments. And the twelve, the number of God's people in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And so here's this woman with the moon under her feet. The moon that reflects the light of the sun. The sun being Christ, the sun of righteousness who's risen, who's just resurrected from the dead, who's shining with the glory of the gospel of salvation to all peoples. And this is the light that the Old Testament had been reflecting and pointing to all along. And here is the woman in this glorious, exalted position, but yet helpless and vulnerable, pregnant. And you see this menacing shadow of an enormous red dragon that is there ready to devour the child as soon as the child is born. Of course, the child could only be one character that had been prophesied throughout the Old Testament. The seed of David who would come and rule his people with a rod of iron. And you see this imagery also presented here. And what John immediately grasps and is familiar with this is that this is telling the story of God's people who have spanned the time of the Old Testament right up to the time of Christ. And Christ, this child who had been promised, who was born into this world through this line of God's people, comes into a scene where immediately from the time of his birth, his life is in jeopardy. Satan is after him through his earthly powers. You remember the decree that went out, right? on the time when Christ was born from Herod, a governor who had been appointed by Rome, that all the children two years old and under were to be put to death. It's truly fitting that Satan is depicted, this enemy power, this great red dragon, this serpent who's depicted here about to devour Christ as soon as he is born and this helpless child who is born to this woman, this line of God's people. But this great red dragon also is representing Satan most specifically, but it's also representing the powers through which Satan operates here in this world. It's been, if you look at this dragon, he mirrors some of the beasts that you find described in Daniel chapter 7. You find a great beast there who also has seven heads and ten horns. This beast who also is attacking and persecuting God's people. And the seven heads are described as different powers through which Satan has operated throughout time. The horns on his head mirror the ten horns that are on the beast of Daniel 2, which represent after Rome, the last of these powers breaks up into pieces. It divides up into ten kingdoms, these ten horns that you also see in Daniel. And you find that these crowns tell us that this is during a time where this earthly power is in a position of kingship, of rulership. This is a time where he is operating as a king and as a, as a royal power here in this world. So the first scene of Revelation finds that it tells us the story that walks us right up to the time where Christ is born the child. And right up to the time where Satan is working through Rome, this great red dragon, the, the puppet of Satan to persecute Christ specifically during the time when he's on earth. But ultimately... When Christ is caught up, it says that he begins to look at the woman. So the question is, well, where did this story all begin? We see it here in this world, and, and we've seen glimpses throughout the Old Testament of, of this battle between good and evil. But where did it all begin anyway? And what a lot of people don't realize and don't think about very often is the backstory that the Old Testament tells us and paints of how this all began. It wasn't, it wasn't just here in a place where there were faulty people, where there were people who had things that someone else wanted and someone had a bad temper or, or a, a big ego and a power problem. No, 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 no. The Bible throughout the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 14 and in Ezekiel 28 gives us the backstory about a place where it was so perfect, everything was beautiful, everything was fantastic, heaven itself. How much better can you get than heaven? And you find the story of a beautiful angel created the most exalted cherub of the angels of God, closest to God's throne, 
who's able to be there and see as much as is seeable by the creations of God, all of the beauties of God's character. And as the psalmist said, in God's presence is fullness of joy. In God's presence is the delights of eternity. And, and this angel is right there and he can see as much as is revealed about God's love and about God's goodness. But we find throughout the Bible, throughout Ezekiel 28, that the angel's thoughts were taken away from God and pointed inward. Pride grew in his heart until he surmised that he wanted to place his throne above God's throne. You've heard this story before. And in this perfect place where there were perfect angels who were created, serving a perfect God who you can't get any better and more perfect than our God is, you find that sin began in the heart grew until it conceived in something horrifying. And as the great strategist and military general said, war is all about deception. And that's exactly where Lucifer, the covering cherub, began to become Satan, the enemy of God. Deception, woven, misperceptions of God, misperceptions about his government, misperceptions about his law, his goodness, how he ruled, and if Lucifer, Satan, were placed in that position, he could do a much better job than God. And you find in the next scene of Revelation, it gives us the backstory, the origin of where this all began. Verse 7 it says, there was a war that broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels. Verse 8, and prevail not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great red dragon was cast out, that old serpent, the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out and down to this earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, for the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them and, the inhabitants of the, and woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. This second scene of Revelation 12, it's right in the middle of this continuous flow about the dragon's interaction with the woman, God's bride on earth. And it goes, takes us back out of the flow of the story and gives us the origin of Satan. But then, right after this, it's going to put us right back in the story and pick up where Satan's attention, the dragon's attention, is focused on this woman. But what this tells us is that the tail that swept a third of the stars of heaven, Revelation 1, tells us the stars represent angels. A third of the angels of God who God had created pure and good and holy were caught up in this web of deception and of lies and lost their place in heaven with Satan because they believed the lies that he was spreading. So subtle, so deceptive. And I always go back and I think about it in my mind and I think, how could this be? How could it be that if angels who can go into God's presence and clear up any miscommunication by simply saying, God... Here's what we're hearing, and yet this is what we've always thought. Can you, can you shed some light on this? Can you help us understand? And yet angels who could be face to face with God and morning and evening would be joined together in the worship of God, not just in a church like this where by faith we, we worship Him and we pray to Him and we learn about Him, but right in His very presence. How could it be possible that these angels could get caught so much in this web of deception that they would believe Satan and lose their places in heaven. Believe what he was saying about God. Believe what he was saying about his government. Believe what he was saying about his law. Believe that they could overthrow the God who had created them and set up a new government where his throne had once stood. How could it be that this master deceiver could create a deception so convincing that angels with intellects much greater than ours in the very presence of God, without the propensity to sin, could believe Satan and be swept out of heaven with him. Whenever I stop and I think about that, 
I think about myself in my own life. I think about the fact that we each study God's Word, we each want to do what's right, but we each find ourselves in situations sometimes where what I see God's Word is telling me and what I see is right sometimes doesn't agree with someone else who's reading the same Bible as me, who also believes that what they're doing is right and what they're believing is right. And what it tells me is that what Jesus said in Matthew 24 is true and it's going to be even more true as we get closer to the final events in this world's history. That Jesus said that the deceptions of Satan as we get near the end of time are going to be so convincing to the mind, to the eyes, to the senses, that unless we're so grounded in God's word that when Satan comes to us with anything that's even slightly off track, we can say, no, 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 it is written, it is written, it is written, and go by faith in what God has written in his word, that what Jesus said is going to be true about you and I. If possible, even the very elect will be swept up in the final deceptions to come on this world and lose out on the eternal kingdom that God has promised to us. If it could happen to angels, friend, in heaven, is it possible that it can happen to you and I? If it can happen to Adam and Eve created in God's image and placed in a garden, is it possible that it could happen to you and I? If it could happen to one of the disciples who walked and talked with Jesus for three and a half years, is it possible that it could happen to you and I? And so that's why when somebody sits and says, well, I'm so glad that I'm not deceived, I think to myself, well, that's exactly how a deceived person thinks. That's exactly what a third of the angels in heaven thought. That's exactly what Eve thought and Adam thought. That's exactly what Judas thought. I'm so glad I see things more clearly than everyone else, friend. It's not safe to test ourselves alone against the roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. God tells us that this word is more important to us than our daily food. And God tells us that he's trying to bring together his flock where there's one flock and where there's one shepherd and where there's safety in numbers. And it's not the shepherd who wants the lambs to wander away from the flock. The shepherd says, I'm calling my sheep and they know my voice. But it's the wolf who lives in the den, in the mountains, who looks down on the flock of sheep and thinks, if I can just lead them away from the rest of the flock, if I can just lead them away from the shepherd, if I can just get them not to go and seek God and trust his word and be with the body that Christ, the flock that Christ is bringing together, then Satan sees that there's a chance for the wolf to devour that lamb. Satan has always been the accuser of the brethren. Satan has always been the dragon. Satan has always been the roaring lion, and he's always the wolf seeking whom he may devour since this began in heaven. But I want you to see something here, because right in the middle of this, there's something that you may have missed. You see, first of all, he's cast out of heaven. First of all, he loses this war, and they're cast out of heaven in verse 9. But then there's a loud declaration that's made in verse 10, that can't be referring to the exact same time period. It's got to be referring to sometime after that original war that happened in heaven before Eve and Adam sinned on this earth. There's a gap that happens between verse 9 and verse 10 that you may have missed the first time through. You see, the war happens in heaven and he's cast out. But at some time later, there's an announcement that's made. Now has come salvation. Well, when did that happen, friend? Now has come strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. When was that true, friends? For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. There's an interesting story in the Old Testament in Job chapter 1 and 2 that describes Satan going back to heaven and having a conversation with God in the presence and the assembly of all of his angels and the leaders of any unfallen worlds out there that God has created. This council in heaven, and it says that Satan came also among them. And when God asks him, where have you been? What have you been doing? He says, well, I've been walking to and fro on the earth. And God says, well, in all of those long walks you've been doing, did you notice? Have you considered my servant Job? He's a specimen of what my people can be 
if they trust me completely with everything that they have and everything that I've created them to be? And Satan sneered back at God and he says, well, I've seen him, but I've also seen how you've been spoiling him. He's one of your favorite sons. You're giving him all the best toys. You're blessing him in everything that he does. And God says, okay, I see it differently. But to show you and everyone else who's watching that it's not just because I've blessed him that he's serving me, you can have access to him. And God allows Satan, you know the story, to come at Job with a series of calamities where all the way down from his possessions to his children, they're taken from him in a single day. And yet Job is there and he refuses to curse God and so the council convenes again and Satan again comes into this council and he accuses Job before God and he says, no, 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 it's because you wouldn't let me touch him. So when finally God gives him permission, you read throughout the story of Job, that Job struggles with this, why is God allowing this to happen? And yet Job finds himself saying again and again, Naked came I into this world, naked will I go out of this world. Even if he were to slay me, I would still serve him. Because Job says in verse chapter 19, I know that my Redeemer lives and that he will stand on this earth in the last days and that after worms des destroy this body, in my flesh I will see God whom I will see for myself and my eyes will behold and not another. You see, Job knew who his Redeemer was. Job knew, Job knew the God who he trusted in. And so no matter what Satan was able to bring to him, Job stayed firm until the end. And when Job finally realized that even though his friends hadn't had the same calamities that he had had, their doubt and their confusion about God and his character placed them in a worse condition that he was in in spite of everything he had lost. The story ends by saying that finally when Job prays for his friends, the Lord turns everything around for Job. And he's blessed again, and the end of his life is even more blessed than the first part of his life. We think back on this story because this tells us that even after Satan and his angels had been cast out of heaven, he was allowed a certain access to the heavenly councils as a representative of this world. When Satan came to tempt Jesus, he tells Jesus on a mountaintop as Jesus looks at the, the dazzling cities and the great kingdoms that Satan has, has influenced in this world, the great pyramids of the Mayan Empire and the Aztecs, the, the great structures of Greece and Rome and these generals and these powers, and Satan says, do you see all that? You see it all in its glory? I will give you everything you see. As far as your eyes can see, it's yours if you bow down and worship. Because he says, all the kingdoms of this world have been delivered over to me as their ruler. But if you worship me, I will give it over to you. Isn't this what you came for, Christ? You see, Satan had been acting as the representative of our world, but there's a time where the story turned. Open to keep, keep a marker in Revelation 12, but I want you to turn back to John. I want you to see something in John chapter 12. From Revelation 12 to John 12. Jesus is in the temple for the last time in this chapter of John on that weekend when he's about to give his life on the cross. It's the sacrifice for sin. And in John chapter 12, verse 32 and 33, listen to what Jesus says. Actually, verse 31 and 32. Jesus says, now is the what? judgment of this world. Now shall who? The prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to, all unto me. You see, Christ came back into this world that had been overtaken, conquered, ruled by Satan, the master of the art of war who had led this world in a series of battles, of bloodshed, of, of miseries, of disasters. And Christ said, I've come to redeem the world, but it's not going to be by compromising even in one detail by when no one else is watching, bending a knee before Satan to win it back. I'm not going to take the easy way. I will 
redeem this world. I will cast this enemy out. He will be a defeated foe, but it's not going to be through any compromise. The only way it can be done is by a life for a life, a life for a world. And Christ showed that there was no greater love than this, that a man should lay down his life for his friends. And with that death on the cross, the heel was placed upon the head of the serpent, and Satan lost access, was cast out once and for all, never again to enter the councils of heaven. Satan, the accuser of the brethren, was cast out. But when he was cast out that final time, he knew that he now had just a very short time from Christ's death till everything would be fulfilled and he met his fate. And so he came down with great fury and wrath, and where he couldn't reach Christ anymore, who had been taken up to heaven, he now looked at you. He looked at Timothy. He looked at Susie. He looked at Alpha. And he said, I'm going to do everything I can to destroy and harass and wipe out these people who are still trusting in Jesus and his commandments. Let's look at the last scene. Going back to Revelation 12. The last scene, verses 13 to 17. It says here, verse 13, And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, and he then he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she was nourished for a time and times and half a time. In Hebrew, this is understood as three and a half years. The same as verse 6 where 1,260 days Three and a half year time period prophetically. We're going to come back to this next sermon, but let's continue for now. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water, as Elpha was singing about. He cast out water as a flood after this woman. He tried to overwhelm her. He tried to drown her. He tried to cause this current of water to swirl and wash her away. But it says what? The earth helped the woman, verse 16. It opened its mouth and it swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Verse 17, the dragon was wroth with the woman and he went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and the have the testimony of Jesus. This last scene, Satan sees he cannot harass Christ the way he did when Christ was on earth. But he looks to God's people and the years that follow Christ's death, you see wave after wave of persecution hurled against those who want to be faithful to God. First, it's the apostles, martyred one after one after another until John finally can't be killed as the Roman emperors try to do away with him in oil. But then more rise up to their place, and as new emperors come on and bring, Nero brings another wave, kills Paul and many other Christians in some of the most cruel fashions imaginable, and then Domitian and Diocletian and others come, and persecution after persecution is swept upon them. Christians are fed to lions, buried alive, burnt at the stake, tortured, killed by gladiators. Until you find the time period where Constantine's conversion takes place. But yes, all of a sudden, Rome becomes Christian. All of a sudden, Christianity becomes political. But it's not the Christianity of the Bible. It's not the followings of Jesus that you read begin to take place. But there are people who say, we will live by the Bible and the Bible only. There's no other book that we need to be the lamp unto our feet and the light unto our path. No other tradition that we need than God's word that is to be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And anyone who takes that stance is hunted. And they have to flee, as this woman does, into the wilderness, as Elijah did into the wilderness, where God gives them refuge. You find the tale of the Waldenses, the Albigenses, the Huguenots, who run and preserve the Scriptures, and at the risk of their own lives, they memorize entire books of the Bible and portions and weave them into their clothes, and they come back down into the cities and little by little share the Gospel and share the Word of God with those who have had it taken away from them and locked up in the monasteries. And You find that, yes, God does, Satan does persecute them because he hates God's commandments. He's hated his commandments from the beginning when he was in heaven because they're the foundation of God's government. And he hates 
the testimony of Jesus, which Revelation chapter 19, 15 tells you is the spirit of prophecy. It's the message of Jesus that has inspired the prophets to write from the beginning of time to the end of time. It's the gospel of Jesus that's recorded in your word from beginning to end all the way to the end of time. Anyone who God speaks through with his spirit and gives a message to his people that's truly from God and doesn't contradict his word is the spirit of, test of prophecy that is given to his people. And Satan hates it. Because he doesn't want you to know what God's will is for your life. He doesn't want you to live out any principles of God's government. And he does not want you to keep his commandments. And you see the attack continue today. You see attacks to take ten commandments out of visible locations where they've been set up. You see attacks to take God's word and prayer out of schools so that the children won't learn to pray and won't learn what God's Word says from a very young age. You see how families Satan attacks in the homes so that there's a numerous list of a myriad of other things that could be done, much less spending time as a family reading what God's Word has said to be passed on from one generation to another. You find attack after attack, in fact, this last week in the Supreme Court. You find, again, attacks coming. You find those who are Christian bakers who say that, yes, well, I don't have a problem if, if you're going to live out your freedoms to say that you're going to marry someone who's a gender that God didn't intend you to marry, and you want to do that. I'm not going to interfere with your freedom to do that, but I can't support that as a Bible-believing Christian, and so I can't bake a cake that endorses what you're doing, and I'm not going to go, and I'm not going to support what you're doing. And you find that Satan turns the hand of the government against them through activists and groups to where they're shut out of business, they're persecuted, they're harassed, because Satan hates God's Ten Commandments, and he hates this book that you hold in your hands. You see it being played out more and more visibly every week if you follow the headlines and the news and what's going on in our country, which was intended to be a place of religious freedom where Christians could worship God instead of being marginalized, pressed out, and persecuted. We're going to get a little bit more into this topic the next week, but I just want you to know that Satan hasn't gone anywhere and disappeared. And yet, we're not to see Satan as an enemy who's so big and so strong that he wants, God wants us to tremble with our knees whenever we know that he's coming. You shouldn't venture onto Satan's ground because God can protect you as long as you don't put yourself in a place where Satan has access to your life. There was a young man who, when I was working with Messiah's Mansion, was traveling with us in the summertime. And he had a certain artist that he really liked to listen to. And uh, I don't know if uh, some of you probably have heard the name before, but it, one his favorite artist was Lady Gaga, who is someone who's had a, a sex change to be a different gender. And he really liked her, and at school, he went to a Christian school, he wasn't allowed to listen to this music at school. But he would have it on his iPod and he would, you know, sneak it. And one day as, as he was going about the ministry that we were doing, he was sick and he was back in the room by himself. And all of a sudden we got a message that he was absolutely terrified. And he said that he was sitting in his room and he was listening to his music. And all of a sudden he just felt this horrific chill and fear that went down his spine. And he said he looked across the room and all of a sudden he saw this figure that just terrified him to death and it had like teeth hanging out of its mouth, but it had a smile on its face and it was just waving at him from across the room and he buried his head under the sleeping bag until he got encouraged to run out of the room and pray and he said, you know what, I'm done. He said, I've realized that what some of these singers and what some of these artists and this one particular is into is something that is not going to give God the power to work into my life, but it's giving Satan access to be able to harass me like this. And there were a couple other incidents that happened like that that finally led him to cut the cord because he didn't want Satan to have access anymore to his life. Satan's a defeated foe by Christ. He's cast out of heaven. He can't have access to your life unless you let him. God may allow him, like Job, to persecute you for a time from the outside, but he has no power to control you yourself unless you give it over to him. 
Mark Finley shared a story, a great evangelist, shared a story when I was at the university. He came through on one weekend, and he shared how a few years back he was down in San Antonio for a big conference. And during the course of the conference, a woman came up to him and said, would you please come to my house and pray for me? Because I've had demonic things happening inside my house. And so Mark Finley and several other pastors got together. They prayed. They prepared themselves, make sure they were right with God. And they went over to her house, and he said, all right, take me to the room where this is happening. And so she took him to the, the, the room. The other pastors went in there into her bedroom, and he opened his Bible, and he just began to claim the promises of God. And nothing happened. It was a peaceful setting there in the room. They prayed. They claimed promises, went to every room in the house, prayed for this woman, prayed for her house. And all of a sudden, they heard a shriek and a scream come from outside the house. And so they quickly went to the front door to find out what was going on. And this was happening in downtown San Antonio in an apartment complex. And there were apartments across the street and small houses where she was in one of these little condos on the other side. And they watched as a car that was in the parking lot. And some lady had just gotten home, got out of her car, took her groceries and her keys with the car turned off in park. And walked into the house, and as she was going into the house, her car started rolling backwards out of the driveway, across the street, lifted up because there was a fence going around the house, lifted up off the ground, and just went flying at the side of the house to the window where Mark Finley and this woman and the others had been praying, and just got to the outside of the door but couldn't go any further than that. And he said, we all watched as the car just hovered there for five minutes nearly outside the window with nothing supporting it above or beneath until the car came tumbling down into the, into the driveway, into the yard, inside the fence. And he said, you can imagine the response of the wrecker who came to take it out and was wondering, where's the gate that you got this in here through? You see, Satan is a defeated foe. Satan might have the power to harass you from the outside, but if you in your life have committed yourself to God and are seeking to follow what God's Word has told you, There's nothing he can do but writhe on the outside and harass you. He cannot actually do anything to you to take away your inner peace and cause you to lose your salvation. So knowing that, Satan's attacks are focused against God's commandments and against the Word of God that tells the gospel of Jesus, knowing that the only power you have to overcome him is by the blood of the Lamb this told about in the gospel, and the word of your testimony that you share with others about how God has worked deliverance in your life. This is a war that we're nearing the very end of. Satan knows that he has a short time from when Christ died on the cross, and he knows that it's even shorter today, and so he's ramping up the heat. But what you and I need to realize is that Christ has already defeated Satan. He has no power over you in your life. In fact, he's committed authority to you over Satan and his power. He says that those who follow in his name can cast out devils in his name. They can do all manner of works. They can pray, and and devils will have to flee before them. And he's given you and I the commission to play the final part in this battle of God. And as you look out these church doors and you see houses and you see cars and as you see people, he's looking at you and he's saying, the final battle for this Claremore Seventh-day Adventist church is to reach Claremore for Jesus. We don't have to worry about everything beyond that. God's put you here and he says, you reach Claremore. And that's exactly what we intend to do this next year, is to reach out into our community to go to the captives who have been chained by Satan, to go to those who have put God's Word on the shelf and haven't read it for some time, to those who have gotten confused by all of the pop philosophy and psychology that's out there, that you can be any one gender any day and then the next day, that goes and says that you can marry anybody that you like, that goes and says that you shouldn't read God's Word, you shouldn't pray in public, you shouldn't, you shouldn't, you shouldn't, that calls good evil and evil good. And he's called us to go out there And find those people. And before the final judgments come on this world, to participate with Christ in grasping them like brands and plucking them out of the fire. And grasping them with those who are drowning and helping God to pull them out again. And I can't do it alone, friends. You can't do it alone, friends. 
This next year, we're going to have to work together. And throughout the year, I'm going to be sharing with you some ways that you can help participate in our church reaching Claremore for Jesus and working together with others who are trying to reach Claremore for Jesus. The end is near. Are you ready for Jesus to come? Is Claremore ready for Jesus to come? I'd like